So, Ricard, at his country house in Sweden uh, with another talk with Barry Greenstein. It's been a while, Barry. How are you? Um, I'm doing fine. How come I didn't get an invitation to come out to the country house? You have a standing invitation anytime. It's in the woods in, on the west coast of Sweden. You can come here exactly anytime. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, you should come here maybe uh, next summer to recreate uh, after the World Series, maybe. Okay, okay, that sounds like sounds like a good idea. I'm sure uh, I can get Alex to. I can't get her to go anywhere with me. You know, I always try to talk to her, talk her into going with me on these trips. Uh, but uh, the woods in Sweden, I think I could sell that one. Yeah, you can do that. There's, there's, there's absolutely no casino in sight uh, within miles, within yeah. a long way. Anyway, yeah. have you uh, have you uh, are you okay after the World Series? Have you rested anything? Uh, no, I don't, really don't rest. I still play poker most days. Uh, I'm disappointed. I had a real good shot to do something at the World Series. I got up probably counting uh, cash games and turn, mostly tournaments because I, I had a second early. I remember I was up like about 120000 early on. And by the end of the World Series, it seemed like I ended up about even. Uh, uh, you know, part of it being I uh, didn't cash in the 50K, so that takes a big chunk out. But it was disappointing uh, because uh, you know, I felt like it could have been a big World Series. You know, that's the first reason it was disappointing. And the second is because that's right now the time of the year I was kind of dependent on to make money. Yeah. Because the, the games where I live just aren't that big or lucrative uh, uh, now. You know, I, I don't know where they are. They are that good. You know, the economy's down. So I just kind of thought, hey, the World Series is the time to make a lot of money. You know, there have been times in the World Series I've made millions of dollars. Mm. So, uh, you know, I really was, you know, going in, I was thinking make at least $100 at the World Series. You know, that was my expectation. Mm. And instead, basically, I spent, uh, uh, you know, two months in Las Vegas and, and ended up uh, at zero. Okay. So that's, that's not good. That's not good. Okay, what are you going to, uh, how are you going to... Um what what is your plan to make some good money then? It's hard. Wait for wait for next year's World Series. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, that's almost like you know. As I was thinking through it, I was like, when's the next time I really have those kind of expectations? The World Series is a great time for me because it's the World Series of poker as opposed to the World Series of hold'em. And again, hold'em these days is it's like the talent. You know, it's been saturated. You know, with a lot of good players, uh, whereas. All around poker, you know, I'm still, you know, in my mind anyway, one of the elite players, and you know, my results usually show that when we're playing lots of different games. And uh, um, so, you know, now what I'll be doing instead, for instance, traveling wise, is I'll be going to Barcelona in a couple weeks, and obviously it's just going to be no limit hold'em. You know, it's not that I'm not a favorite against that field uh, and those fields in tournaments, and maybe I'll be able to get into some side games, but. Uh, you know the edge just isn't that great when you talk about a game where you know we we have, you know these days we poker have a lot of competent players. Yeah, I know it, it's really the most. I mean the the most difficult tournament right now is to play a no limit hold'em tournament uh, for for you, right? It would be. Yeah, just because the competition. I mean, it's easier in Europe than it is where I am. Uh, you know, on the West Coast, if we have a WPT on the West Coast or in Las Vegas, that's that's the toughest fields we play in. Yeah. Uh, where Europe, uh, despite what you know the Europeans may think, is still going to be an easier field just because it's still not as old a market. And uh, if you can go into smaller countries, then it becomes uh, even easier. Yeah. Uh, and still, the East Coast of the United States is still easier than the West Coast, also. Yeah. But I haven't been traveling to the East Coast. Oh. Are you, do you plan to come to several uh, EPTs in, in Europe um, after Barcelona? I'm not sure. You know, I, I uh, will. You know, I usually go to one EPT. Normally, uh, what my, my my schedule has been in the past is go to EPT London and the uh, you know the grand final, which you know, is often in Monte Carlo. Uh, that's what I do as far as EPTs, and then uh, you know, the last few years, the World Series of Poker Europe. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean. Now, yeah. If I had to guess, this year I'll do the, those three venues also. Plus, I'm going to Barcelona. Okay. Uh, and uh, so, you know, that's at least one extra. Maybe I'll do another one. Okay. So it's it's Barcelona now, and then it's not that far off to uh, 
EPT London and the World Series of Poker Can, they usually, uh, they are pretty close to each other, I guess, right? Yeah, they have been at times. Um, I actually, you know, I, I haven't I'm, I'm pretty, yeah, I'm pretty oblivious to this stuff. If you want to know the truth, I don't, you know, I mean, I normally don't know anything about a schedule unless someone from Poker Stars emails me and says, uh, have you made accommodations for such and such an event? Yeah. You know, that's, that's usually, you know, they usually give me a month advance notice. Yeah. Uh, I don't look at any of that stuff. Don't look at the schedule. So yeah, sometimes Alex has, has it marked on a calendar somewhere and I notice it. We have a calendar up in the, in the bedroom. Yeah. Uh, or like I say, more, more usual is just that someone from Poker Stars asked me if I'm going somewhere. Yeah. But I know, I know uh, the EPT in London has been pretty good uh, over the, I mean, every year. It's been increasing, I think. I don't, I don't, were you there last year at the EPT in London? I was, and I lost about, uh, close, I lost a lot of money, actually. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, and then I, well, you're right, then I, from there I went to the, uh, uh, to the main event in Monte Carlo, and we played a lot of Chinese poker. I played some of the cash games, and I didn't beat them, which was disappointing. And at the Victoria, which is where I played, there were some mixed games, and actually we had some pretty good games, good games, and I still lost. And then we played Chinese poker after the games broke up, and I lost, as you recall, because uh, uh, I told you, between that and, and Monte Carlo, every single session of Chinese poker, which is probably about 10, except one, and that was the time you came and dealt. Yeah, you haven't told them about our deal, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't no. Know what, yeah, I don't know what you did, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to definitely have you around for my Chinese poker sessions yeah. while I'm in Europe. No, I don't think that would be an issue. It was pretty fun to deal. I, I, well, is it a secret who's in those games, or, or, uh, or, or is that private? I don't think so. I don't no. think there's anyone who, who it was, cares. It was Robert Misraki. Uh, I don't remember who played in that game I dealt uh, for you. I had uh, two, Victor, I, was it? Wasn't Victor Ram there? Yeah, he was there for a while. And the the, the guy who had the room. Uh, yeah, the yeah, his name's, yeah, Ellie, but not Ellie Elezra, Ellie from France. Yeah, Ellie, that's right. It, and uh, I don't think anyone will be embarrassed because uh, more or less everybody won but me. So yeah, yeah. There's, there's nothing to embarrass <laughs> anyone about except for me. Yeah, that's fine. I, I remember I started the, uh, I dealt some time back in 2006, some big... 1,000, 2,000 Euro uh, Chinese poker games with uh, some big players. And I, I remember I brought two decks and I dealt and I kept the score sheet. And I mean, that was pretty early. But these days, a lot of people play Chinese. Right. Well, now they've got a new form that they're playing. Yeah. And it's called Face Up Chinese. Uh, did you know that game or not? No. The, uh, it's actually supposed to be pretty big in Finland. Okay. And you you start. I'll describe it. Uh, I won't describe all the scoring because it's a little extra. But uh, you you start with five cards and you arrange them just like Chinese poker. You should practice this mm -hmm. when you're doing nothing. And see how hard it is. You put them down, and it's not obvious where the card should be. Typically, small cards go in front, medium cards in the middle, and big cards in the back. There's a lot, it's a lot tougher than that. But apparently, like I said, it's played a lot in Finland, and they're good at it because they've been playing it. For, someone told me that's the way they play Chinese poker in Finland. And then what happens, each person who's playing gets one card at a time and arranges them. And to give you an idea how tough it is, the first three times I've played it, I fouled my hand. And if you foul your hand, you get scooped. Yeah. So like if you put a punt and you end up making a bigger pair in the middle and a bigger pair than that in the back, ah. you're going to have a fouled hand. So if you gamble at the beginning, you you know it may not pay off. Oh, I see. But, and so it's a really interesting game. It's much more interesting than regular Chinese poker. And as a result, we have people playing uh, who uh, don't even play Chinese poker. It's more like a logic puzzle. Yeah. It's actually complicated enough. I mean, chess players won't agree with me, but there's a lot of chess similarities, as I've thought about more. There's like an early game, a middle game, and an end game. And yeah. the strategy is different in each of those parts. And chess has that similarity there too. Okay. Uh, and so it's uh, it's kind of, it, it's just an intriguing game. There's no question. But I played it, and I've actually won money. I, I'm not good. I'm sure of that. But as I look around, the other American players I played with, they're not very good either. Because I can see we're all kind of just uh, you know, it's like the blind leading the blind. You know, we're, yeah. we're playing in the dark. But a couple Finnish kids came in, 
And I'm not going to tell you the two Americans they played who thought they were pretty good at the game, but they took them for at small stakes, <laughs> relatively small stakes. These two Finnish kids won 130,000 off the two really? Americans. Really? Oh my god. Oh so they just God. blitzed them because they were good at it, an expert apparently. Yeah. And here's the funny thing. You know, the way you know, people often ask me, who was your mentor who taught you poker? And the answer is no individual person, but the way you learn poker, the way you did back in my day, it's a little different now because there are teaching schools and the books are better and stuff like that. The way I learned probably any game that I learned, whether it's sports or, or, or games or whatever, is uh, you know you see someone who's better than you or good at it, and you try to see what they're doing and try to understand it, and possibly even try to copy it. Yeah. So at this game, you know, I tried to look around, and I, you know, I, I immediately started asking because I wanted to get good. People were playing it for money. I said, well, who's who are the good players? So I asked individually, like confidentially, about eight different people: who's good and who's not. Who should I look at? And it was really it funny that every single person who was named as a good player was also named as a fish by really? someone else. Okay, yeah. That, so that's, that's how, it how it, yes, so, so it's like there really is a consensus who the good players are too much. And uh, I wish I was around when those two Finnish kids were playing because I have a feeling that they were the good players and I could have learned something from them. Yeah. So instead, I'm forced like everyone else to, uh, uh, and I'm kind of missing out because they're still playing in Vegas and now they're getting further ahead of me. And I'm sure they're learning new stuff by playing and I'm not playing at all back, back here at home. Uh, um but uh, it's a game you should, uh, you know, anyone listening to this video who likes to gamble, likes Chinese poker, test that at home. It, and the thing about this game is the scoring is if you win two out of three, you only get one point instead of two like we play yeah. in regular Chinese poker. And if you scoop or if the person fouls, it's basically the same. You get six. So, so you yeah. do know the game. You put up your finger. No, no. no and, I, heard, I heard that point counting because some Swedish guys are playing... One and six. Six is scoop and one is two, two versus one, one which is but, very uh, uh, different from two, four or two, five. But there's more to it than that. There's royalties. Of course. And any pat hand to the back is a royalty. It's not the regular royalties of Chinese poker. Oh. A, straight, a straight is worth two in the back. A flush is worth four. Uh, a, uh, uh, a full house is worth six. Quads are worth eight. A straight flush is worth ten. And a royal flush is worth twenty, although... We've never heard of anyone no. getting that. Well. Uh, and in the middle, if you get those things, it would be double. Because remember, you got it in the middle, yeah. you'd also yeah. have a higher one in the back. Yeah. And in the front, a pair of sixes is the minimum is the minimum royalty is worth one. A pair of sevens is two, all the way up to a pair of uh, yeah, I have to count on my fingers: sixes, sevens, eights, nines, tens, jacks, queens, nine. kings, aces. Uh, aces would be nine, yeah. and then three deuces would be ten. And, so and on. Vlad Vladimir Shemilov got trip nines in front. He got a hand trip nines, trip aces, and a full house. Trip nines <laughs> by themselves is worth seventeen. Oh my god! Plus, yeah, the yeah, full yeah. house at the back was six, so that got him to twenty three. And he scooped everyone with his hand because this is just a monstrous hand. Yeah, he got twenty nine points. It was worth twenty nine points against his opponents. That's the biggest hand I've heard of. I mean, trip nine is just absurd. He, what happens? He got the full house early, so he could make the three aces in the middle, and then he had two nines in front. And the last card hit the third nine. Okay, the two outer. If you think about it, the, yeah, well, the two outer, but that two outer got him for what nines were worth. If you go from nines to trip nines, that's an increase of thirteen points. Yeah, yeah. that's a huge increase. So yeah, he went a pair from, of nines is worth four, which is really a good hand. Right, so it went uh, uh, from four to seventeen <laughs> with that last card. Okay. Seventeen. Yeah, yeah. That, just the front got for, went from four to seven. Yeah. Huge. And, and so, so very well, often, someone will have a hand that's just like nothing, nothing in a pair or something like that yeah. that isn't fouled. Or no, even, you can even see nothing, you know, eight high, king high, ace high. At really? least you didn't foul. And a lot of times what happens in this game is you see someone went for a flush in the back but isn't, isn't getting it. Yeah. They have pairs in the middle and a flush and they're just dead in the flush. Yeah. Now you play just ridiculously safe. Yeah. Because... They don't get their flush. You're going to scoop them. You don't want to foul your hand. Also, oh, that's you know, a cool game. Have, so it really is a, a, a fun game. People, just, it's it's the rage is, and and uh, if that uh, word translates right to the, 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 to Swedish uh, in in Vegas right now. There, there there was actually a game online where you had 25 cards each, uh, and and you you got five cards in the back, you know, and you played five poker hands, five five poker hands next to each other and you got one card and you had to choose where to put it 
That's like an old uh, solitaire game that we used to play when I was a kid. So you have you start with yeah, five yeah. cards, random, and then mm -hmm. you get one card. And you have to pick where you, you put it, and the next one till you get the fifth card, you have to put it in the one not, not full. So now you got two cards on each row, and finally you get five cards in each row, and those matches your board. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. This hand matches mm -hmm. your there, and and so on. Mm -hmm. and, and you see, of course, the opponent's. Uh, hand so you you try to beat a flush there and a pair there that's a really fun game too but yeah i think i remember playing playing something like that yeah uh, long long time ago yeah anyway uh but that's interesting so you get five cards to begin with you put them down however you want them like one up there two there and two there for example <coughs> very typical yeah one in front two in the middle two in the back very yeah. typically yeah. yeah okay and then you draw cards from the deck or what yeah, yeah. The button has an advantage. He gets to see what the other people will have. So, for instance, if you're the button, then you, have, oh, you can play this heads up, three hand or four hand. But if a bunch of hearts were out, you would not go for the flush. But if they were live, then you would. So, yeah. uh, there's a lot of playing for live cards and you know putting kickers with pairs that are live and putting dead cards up more to the front and and uh, and the biggest thing you're doing is trying not to follow your hand because if you follow it, you get scooped. Yeah. And especially if you play it with people who aren't good. Yeah, of course. Mm. They're yeah, following their hand 25% uh, of the time. <laughs> okay. Well, that's good. Uh, anyway, uh, so that's uh, maybe I can hook you up with some Finnish guys and they can teach you some tricks. Definitely, uh, you know, get, get your uh, Finnish contacts. Uh, uh, not Zygmunt or Patrick, because I already know them, and they're usually clueless at things like this. Uh, but yeah, yeah, some obscure young Finnish kids probably know what they're doing. Hook me up. Okay, I will do that. Okay, so uh, uh, besides Chinese poker, I mean, um, what did you think of the uh, October 9 that we got? Eight Americans and one Hungarian guy. Well, I think the Hungarian guy is the villain. Uh, at this point, uh, not because he's not American, but because of the way he got there. Uh, he was the beneficiary of a very generous ruling. And I think the consensus, including myself, is that the ruling was too lenient. Uh, I would have suggested, uh, I even text Jack Effel as soon as I read the ruling, you know, he made it on the spot. It was a tough decision for him. The guy's hand was gone. He just wiped him out of the tournament, which some people think. One of the things I suggested is the minimum penalty you should get. I'm not saying this was the right penalty, but it's kind of a, a poker or gambling uh, uh, axiom that you can't win what you can't lose, and if you have a chance to win a certain amount, you should be in jeopardy for that same amount. So what I suggested as a minimum penalty, he should have lost what the pot was worth not just a minimum raise, which is what his penalty was. So if he had a chance by raising to win a pot of, let's say, 350000 because that was what was in there, then in this particular thing, his minimum penalty had to be he would lose 350000 Can you I happen to think. Can you tell me shortly what happened in the hand, for those who doesn't know? I actually don't have... I read just recently that... Now it's a few weeks out. Hold on, that, Barry. Uh, Hold on, Barry. The, I, I lost you there. So can you start? What, what happened in the hand shortly? Okay. Uh, well, first I'll give you the poker news report that I've later heard, I've read that that was wrong. I think uh, Gavin Smith was at the table and was on uh, uh, poker. What's it called? Pokercast, the two plus two thing, and said you know, I read that he said something different. Uh, but what the poker news report, which is apparently correct, said was that the uh, French girl had raised in. Uh, I think the blinds were fifteen and thirty thousand at this point. Had raised in for a certain amount, maybe a min raised to sixty thousand, uh, maybe slightly more, but I'm not sure. And that it got to him in the small blind, and he then looked at Gavin Smith, I think, who was the big blind, who had let's say slightly more than ten big blinds, and just said all in. You know, he was putting them all in not realizing there was a bet already in there, a raise already in there. Now Gavin folded and, uh, is his name Kornikai or something like that? Yeah. Now mucked his hand, thinking the hand was over while the other girl still sat with her hand. Uh, and... And... 
uh, stiffest, but he had significant chips at that time. Uh, are you still there? Yeah, I, 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 the French girl was still, still in the hand. That's the last thing I heard. She was in the hand and I think had him covered and would have busted him. Yeah. Okay, so the stiffest probably would have been just strictly interpreting the rules, which is your money's in, your hand's gone, we can't retrieve it, you're out. Yeah. Would have been pretty sad, but, you know, technically by the rules, I think that's the rule. I'm not saying that's the best decision because that's so harsh, but it certainly is a decision that's been made in the past. Uh, now, the French girl claimed, or somebody claimed she had kings. I don't know if that's true, and I don't know if she said it publicly because the hand was never shown. I think if I had kings, I would have shown them and gotten really upset about it. Yeah, of course. Um, so I don't know if that's true for sure. Um, on the other hand, uh, uh, so, or, or yeah, well, well, so he was just given a penalty, which is pretty tame, of a minimum raise, essentially calling her. Let's say a raise was sixty dollars, calling her raise and folding. So he was giving the minimum penalty you could even think of at this point. And uh, I think, if anything, the penalty should have become should have been somewhere in between. Uh, maybe it should have been what his expectation... I wish he would have shown her hand. Uh, I mean, uh, could, uh, well, well, one way to solve would be that uh, I'll put you all in, like putting Gavin Smith all in for 10 big blinds. If, if, if it can be interpreted that way, and then she, that's what he should pay. Actually, I think that's, a, I didn't even think of that, but I think you're right. That yeah. sounds like the good middle ground ruling, yeah. that he put Gavin all in, now she raised over the top and he folded, yeah. and she gets the amount equal to what Gavin did. I like that ruling, and I didn't even think of it until you mentioned it. I think that would have been good. And that points to something I told you off the record is that one thing that we do in bridge that we, we don't do in poker is there's a committee of poker players who make rulings in these tough decisions that aren't maybe covered by the rules or maybe the strict interpretation of the rules might be too harsh as, as possibly people would deem in this case. You get a, a, you get a, a committee of expert poker players. I think this should be done at all poker tournaments uh, going forward. I hope people hear this. You have a committee determined on these things because just giving a tournament director who doesn't play poker every day and will sometimes miss nuances of some of these tough decisions, I think we need to take it out of the hands of poker tournament directors and put it in the hands of poker players. Yeah, uh, I think it's just uh, done incorrectly in poker. Mm. And so uh, if we'd have done that here, they would have never come up with the ruling that Jack came up with on the spot. I'm not trying to blame Jack. I'm trying to blame the, the, uh, the current techniques that are being used. Yeah. And so here we could have made, uh, you know, no poker player is going to say the guy should get off with this light of penalty. No. And yours, I think, if anyone would have come up with it, is, is the right middle ground. And in a, in a, in a very... Uh, uh, Strict. Uh, I, I, no, no, I'm going... In a very uh, upsetting, for the French girl, twist of fate. Yeah. Corner guy, and I, I apologize if I'm pronouncing his name wrong because I haven't looked at it since the World Series. Uh, he's the one who busted her on the bubble. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's really rough. kind of that's kind of uh, upsetting, and so. But as a result, because a lot of people do feel, uh, a, a lot of people are rooting for the the uh, the French and Norwegian girl to get in, and they were yeah. the double bubble. Yeah, and they thought that would be good for poker, and it's something uh, completely different, as uh, uh, Monty Python fans would say. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, uh, it, it would have made it a little more interesting. Um, and here, this guy, you know, became like a villain. Because he seemingly doesn't deserve to be there, and then yeah. he knocked the French girl out of the bubble. Yeah. You're going to have everyone outside of Hungary rooting against <laughs> this guy. I think. Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's uh, that's it. Okay. Um, I mean, um, do you think? I mean, eight Americans and one one non-American is that? I mean, what do you think of that? I don't like it. Uh, I like the World Series of Poker being the World Series of Poker and having other countries represented. I think it makes it more interesting, and that's one of the nice things we often get in the World Series is a more Olympic feel. You know, yeah. right now I got the Olympics on in the background, yeah. and uh, uh, you know, again, it's maybe un-American, but coming from you know, well, I don't know if we're the wealthiest country anymore. I think China might have taken over us, but uh, you know, in the past we were the wealthiest country. And Russia was the other wealthy country, let's say, in my younger days. And so 
those athletes had an advantage over the smaller countries. They were well subsidized in their training and had an easier route there.